title of today's message is The Way of Love. Oh, uh, Sunday is Valentine's Day, for those who aren't aware of it. Uh-oh, some of you look like you might be surprised. Better hurry up and get out there for uh, tomorrow. I have a friend named Gene, and uh, Brother Gene, he's got a tradition for all the holidays and special times of the year. So tomorrow on Sunday, Gene's going to take his wife Evelyn to Walmart, and he'll have her stand there in the greeting card section, and Gene will pick out and read Valentine cards to her. Now that seems to work fine for Gene, but I doubt many men could get away with that. I asked Brenda what did she wanted for Valentine's Day, and she said nothing. I guess I'll find out tomorrow if she was telling the truth. <laughs> Many people this weekend are focused on the weekend being the weekend of Valentine's Day. Love is in the air, they claim. Did you know that the latest estimates for this year are that over 18 billion, that's with a B, billion dollars will be spent on the event tomorrow called Valentine's Day. All in the name of love. I put that in quotes, by the way. Because as they have done studies, so many studies have shown that when questioned, very few people know the true meaning of love. In fact, it was close to 80% equate love with either the physical act or the emotion or romance rather than the choice and the discipline that love is. You see, love is not an emotion. You may feel good when you choose to love someone, but love is a decision. It's an act. And this idea, this twisted sense of what love is, is not new. It's not a new phenomenon. The Apostle Paul took a chapter in his letter in the, to the Corinthians to help them understand what love is and how important it is in a Christian's life. And I thought we would use that letter that chapter out of that letter in 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 13, and we would review some qualities of love today. If you're there, you're welcome to read along. He says, If I speak in the tongues of men and of angels, but have not love, I'm a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have prophetic powers and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, if I have all faith so that I can remove mountains, but have not love, I am nothing. If I give away everything I own, if I deliver my body to be up to be burned, but have not love, I have gained nothing. Love is patient and kind. Love does not envy or boast. Love is not arrogant or rude. Love does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful. Love does not rejoice at wrongdoing, but rejoices with truth. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. See, love never ends. As for prophecies, they will pass away. As for tongues, they will cease. As for knowledge, it will pass away. For now we know in part, and we prophesy in part. But when perfection comes, the partial will pass away. When I was a child, I spoke like a child. I thought like a child, and I reasoned like a child. But when I became a man, I gave up childish ways. For now we see in a mirror dimly, but then we will see face to face. Now I know in part, but then shall I know fully, even as I have always fully been known. So now faith, hope, and love abide, these three, but the greatest of these is love. See, love is an action. 
Love is something that we choose to do. It's not the feeling. It's not an emotion. And in the first part of this passage, Paul explains that without love, our efforts, our works for God, have no value. Did you pick up on that? We're studying the study of crazy love, and that's, you know, Francis Chan's talking about this crazy love that God has for us and that we're to have for Him. Paul carries it one step further here and says, you can do all these great things. I mean, listen to that list. They work miracles. They were able to move mountains. They were able to know what God wanted to prophesy. And he said, but if you do all that and you don't have love, it's just a wasted effort. It's nothing. It means nothing. You gain nothing. Thankfully, though, he doesn't stop there. He doesn't just say, okay, you got to have love or just quit. He goes on to explain the characteristics to help us to understand this love choice we make. What does it mean when we choose to love? Help us understand that, Paul. If it's not emotion... If it's not the physical act, if it's not this uh, romanticism, what is this love? Well, he says love is patient. Love is kind. Love does not envy or boast. It's not arrogant or rude. It's not insist on its own way. It's not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice at wrongdoing, but rejoices with the truth. Love bears all things believes all things, hopes all things, and endures all things because love never ends. And you know, as I read these, I see that Paul uses contrast. Did you notice that? He uses contrast to help us to understand the selflessness of love. You see, that's the characteristic that I see him sharing there with all these different descriptors is love is selfless. Love is selflessness. Love is patient and kind. Patient and kind. I don't know about you, but it's my opinion that these two attributes are dying out in our society today. Patience and kindness. Well, society today has very little patience for anything. You think not? Just read the headlines or look up the statistics on road rage. Or think about how many times people have made you yourself irritable or resentful while you were driving down the road. Or waiting in line at the supermarket. Come on now. I'm not alone in this. Hit home for some of you, huh? And kindness? Why, kindness is so rare that many times when someone does an act of kindness, it makes national news. It's an event. Young man helps elderly person across the road. CNN's got it everywhere. Sister donates a kidney to a brother. It's all over the internet, all over the news. Kindness. They're kind acts to be sure, but they're acts that are more and more rare every day, and that's why they make the headlines. And envy? We're so far past struggling to not be envious, I mean, that's not even on the agenda anymore, that advertise today blatantly use envy to try to get you to buy their company's products. Look at this cool thing that your neighbor has. Don't you wish you had one too? Envy. And boast? Those same advertisers tell you to buy the product so you can boast that you're the only one in the neighborhood that's got it. Get this. Be the first. Arrogance. Well, that's almost the norm today. And rudeness, don't get me started. We are one rude society. Some people today are so rude 
especially the, some of the younger generation, that I can't help but cringe as I think of how fast my grandmother's hand would have smacked me on the back of my head for acting that way just a few years ago. And then we have Burger King with their slogan, To Have It Your Way. If there's anything about Americans is that we love to have it our own way. It's exactly why we were struggling in our Sabbath school study today. What is the number one reason that we find ourselves calling ourselves lukewarm? It's because instead of wanting and allowing God to have His way, we want to have it our way. Paul is saying, this is all the things that love is not. And rejoicing in wrongdoing, how many people during riots are standing on the side of the street, cheering, wanting those folks to just keep breaking windows and shooting people, rejoicing at wrongdoing. It says love isn't irritable or resentful. Well, with all the that I just described, it's no wonder people are irritable and resentful. There's no love. It's because we're no longer a people who even understand the concept of what love truly is and the selflessness that comes along with it. Much less practice this love. But enough of what it isn't. Let's help understand what love is. He says, love is patient and kind. It rejoices with the truth. It bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things, and never ends. Well, I wanted to go through each one of these to make sure we understood it. Patient. True love is able to accept or tolerate delays, problems, or suffering without becoming annoyed or stressed out. Mm, got you there, didn't I? Let me read that again. He says, True love is able to accept or tolerate delays, problems, or suffering without becoming annoyed or stressed. Enough said. Kind. True love is benevolent. True love is considerate. Or helpful. Kindness is characterized by this benevolence and tenderness. A kind person is disposed to help others and to do so with sympathy and consideration. And godly love in a person's life will make that person kinder because no one can be loving and unkind at the same time. Love rejoices with the truth. You see, true love rejoices in what is right and good, and anything that covers up sin or seeks to justify wrongdoing is the polar opposite of godly love. Anything that covers up sin or seeks to justify wrongdoing is the polar opposite of godly love. You see, love not only does not but cannot sweep sin under the rug. Love does not try to find ways to get away with bad behavior. Love does not put up with injustice. Instead, love treasures truth, celebrates good behavior, and promotes virtue because true love has nothing to hide. That's why we're told that when a brother or sister is caught in sin, that we restore such a one in love. This patient, kind love that rejoices in the truth. The truth that in reaching out to this brother or sister, they can restore such a one to Christ. The motivation here in this restoration from Matthew 18 is one of love. The motivation here in church correction, church discipline, is one of love. 
It's trying to help one another. Say, come on, Pastor Shay, you need to see this and grow because we want you to get closer to God. We care about you. Not one of, ju of judgment or criticism, but one of love. Love bears all things. The true meaning of this statement must be found in either the word cover or contain. Love conceals everything that should be concealed. Love keeps secrets that should be kept. Love retains the grace that is given and goes on to continually increase that love. A person under the influence of this love never makes the sins, the follies, the faults or imperfections of any man or woman the subject of censure or conversation. No gossip, no putting downs. Love covers these sins as far as he can, and if alone, privy to them, he retains the knowledge of them in his heart as far as he should. Now, uh, Benjamin came to me this week, and uh, he asked me, he found a situation where a classmate is doing something wrong, something that he himself was caught doing wrong. And he asked me, he said, Dad, I know what's going on. What should I do about it? And I said, well, son, that's a great question that we're all faced with from time to time. And here's my answer. You first have to ask yourself, what is your motivation for doing something about it? Is it so that this person is judged the same way that you were judged? Or is it because you love this person and you want to see them restored to a right relationship with Christ? Answer that and you'll know what to do. Love is motivated to bear all things. Love believes all things. Those who love will always believe in the other person. There's no second guessing or questioning of whether the person should be loved. Because love is simply given. It's unconditional. Let's think about that word simply given a minute though. I have some glasses here. And let's say that Autumn needed these glasses. Now I can give those to her, right? That's a choice that I make to give her these glasses. But... If I don't give them to her and she takes them anyway, have I given them to her or has she taken them? So she took the choice away from me. But the key word here is to give requires what? A choice. Love is a choice. We choose to love her by giving her glasses so she can see. Although with my glasses, I don't know if they'd be any help. Love gives it chooses to give. Love is unconditional. The loved one doesn't need to perform anything or achieve a certain goal in order to be loved. Just the same way that Christ loves his children unconditionally, he calls us to love others the same way. To make that choice to love them unconditionally, he calls us to do this. Why? Because our love for others is based on who he is and not what others do. It's so critical, I want to repeat it. Our love for others is based on who he is and not on what others do. I almost want to somehow put that as a bumper sticker on the forefront of my mind. A person with God's type of love will always trust. That is, he will not be suspicious of the one he loves. He will be slow to believe any damaging news concerning the loved one and will always give the benefit of the doubt. Whenever the situation, love is always ready to trust. Now that loved one may have a checkered past or be in some other way undeserving of trust, yet true love is able to look past that and meet the need of in the individual. Mistrust, caginess, and suspicion are at odds with godly love. There once was a speaker who held up a blank sheet of paper. He said, what do you see? And of course the crowd replied, 
Nothing. A plain piece of paper. So then he placed the paper on the podium. He made a tiny dot in the center. He said, now what do you see? A dot. That's right, Brother Aaron. So imagine this blank paper is a person, the speaker said. The small dot you see is his or her biggest fault. And the white surrounding the dot represents all this person's worthwhile qualities, which we so easily fail to see. Often a fault seems much bigger than it really is, and we allow it to overshadow the many positive aspects of that person's personality. Love bears all things. Love hopes all things. To hope or to wait for salvation with joy and full confidence. You see, hope not only concerns our belief in Christ, but it also describes who he is to us. The hope within us is what? Christ himself. If Christ lives within us, then his hope will be seen in how we treat others. Living with such an attitude that Christ is in us reflects the way of Christ, leads to holy living, and brings glory to our Heavenly Father. You see, part of showing love is hoping. Part of hoping is seeing the potential in others. As one man said, if we treat people as they ought to be, we help them become what they are capable of becoming. In love, we can always be hopeful and show the confidence in others. And that doesn't rule out the confrontation or the redress of wrongs, but the impact of a positive attitude in the life of another person is incalculable. I am who I am today because of at least two men in my life who poured positivity and belief and hope into me. They didn't look at the problem-prone boy that I was. They looked at the godly man that I could become. And they poured that vision, that hope into me and made me believe in myself even when nobody else did except them. That's what love does. Love hopes. Love sees the potential. Love endures all things. Endurance for the sake of endurance is not the point of this teaching. It's endurance that's motivated by a love for God and others. In 1 Peter 2 and verse 20 it says, If you suffer for doing good and you endure it, this is commendable before God. You see, we're called to endure for what is right. If you get in trouble for something you did wrong and you suffer for it, that's not... That's what you're supposed to have happen. But love, when they get in trouble for things that are right, that they did for God, he says here, Peter says that it's commendable before God. We're called to endure for what is right. And we must show love whether or not it's convenient or easy. Oh my. Oh my. I could have went that whole sermon without saying that one sentence. We must show love whether or not it is convenient or easy. Now, we've never had anyone we've had trouble loving. It's always been convenient and easy to love everyone else, right? Moving on. Never ending. God's type of love will not fail or falter. It is constant. It is forever. As God says in Jeremiah 31, 3, I have loved you with an everlasting love. I believe, church, that if we practice this never-ending love, this constant, everlasting love, there will be far fewer church splits and far fewer divorces. Covenant church memberships. And covenant marriages would remain intact, even through the hard times, because the words divorce and church split would not exist in the minds of those involved. Then at the end of this chapter, Paul names again faith, hope, and love. 
but places love as the greatest, the most important attribute that a follower of Christ must exhibit, love. So to that end, I would like us to reconsider the challenge we read about this week in the book Crazy Love by Francis Chan, and I will quote a passage from his book here. He says, According to God, we are here to love. Not much else really matters. So God assesses our lives based on how we love. But the word love is overused and worn out. What does God mean by love? And then he reads this passage from 1 Corinthians 13 we've read today. And he goes on to say, But even those well-known words from 1 Corinthians 13 have grown tired and overly familiar, haven't they? He says, I was challenged to do a little exercise with these verses, one that was profoundly convicting. So take the phrase, love is patient, and substitute your name for the word love. And for him, it was Francis is patient. Shay is patient. And then read the rest of that passage, inserting your name where it says love. By the end, don't you feel a little like a liar? If I am meant to represent what love is, then I often fail to love people well. How about you? So I would follow up on Pastor Chan's challenge with a challenge to you and to me to change your ways by handing out this agape love tomorrow instead of cards to show agape love tomorrow with the attributes shown in this passage today, not only to your sweetheart, to everyone around you, even those that are hard to love. You know the ones I'm talking about. Folks, God so loved us that Christ died for us. And we must strive to be an example of that same love to a lost and dying world. John 15 and verse 12, Jesus says, This is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. Jesus shared that love, not just with 12 disciples. Jesus shared that love with everyone he came in contact with. What did they criticize Jesus for doing? For eating and drinking with publicans and sinners. He shared that love everywhere. Now, it would have been really easy, based on his heritage, just to gather around those in the Jewish faith that were like him and just love on them. But he didn't. He spread it everywhere. And he showed this 1 Corinthians 13 love in everything he did. Even when he made the cat of nine tails and drove the money changers out. Matthew Henry stated, As the Father loved Christ who was most worthy, so he loved his disciples, who were altogether unworthy. All the love that the saviors, and all that love, the Savior should continue in their love for him and take all occasions to show it. You see, Christ's love should direct us to love each other. God is love, and we're called to be like God, to be conformed to his image. So I challenge you, I charge you this day, embrace this calling to love by examining your own life. Ask for God's help and guidance. Ask for more of His love so that you can be more like Him in showcasing His love to others at every opportunity. It is, after all, as Paul clearly tells us, the most important thing. May God bless you in this endeavor. Amen.